very happy to have with us today. This is going to be terrific. Uh, tonight, um, our presenters are from just mm -hmm. south of uh, Indianapolis. We have Tom Par Potter and Gail Moore. And uh, Tom Potter has experienced a variety of photographic activities. He's taught workshops, the nature travel trips, exhibited in many places, and printed his in his multi-room dark room for others, as well as for himself. And he has inspired many photographers. And uh, he's used for many years large format cameras. Some of our film user people might be excited about this. Uh, Gail Moore was also inspired by Tom and also got into uh, black and white photography in large format cameras. Uh, they also now have become uh, users of digital cameras as well. Um, she has uh, been mentored in photographic skills, large format photography, darkroom printing, and in creating the fine print. Uh, both have studied with Howard Bond of Ann Arbor, Michigan, and John Sexton of uh, Carmel, California. Some of you may be interested, uh, may be uh, familiar with these people. Uh, Tom and Gail have published photography monographs in 2009. They, um, along with photographer Nancy Press, have a gallery in Indianapolis at the Circle City Industrial Complex showing their own work and the work of many other talented photographers. Their presentation tonight is Understanding Light Values for Creating the light, the Fine print. Before I hand it to Tom, I think Rolf has, um, has an announcement to say. Rolf? Um, yeah. Um, Sunday, Tanya and I were at the uh, uh, Run for the Animal event and there was a vendor there from, uh, I don't know if you guys might know this, uh, Raptors Rise uh, Rehab Facility. And uh, they're out of Bedford. And on uh, October 21st, that's a Saturday, there's two sessions, 9 a.m. to 12 and 5 to 7. They're going to have three raptors, uh, three owls, and one kestrel. kestrel. Uh, available for you to take uh, for photographers to take photographs of. They'll be kind of like in a staged uh, area. These birds do not fly. They're tethered, uh, but you can get real close to them if you want to try to do that. Tanya was shooting away all Saturday. Um, <laughs> so um, it is a charge. Uh, it's $25. It's probably for, to raise funds for this organization. $25 for a two-hour session. Um, I did, uh, I scanned the document uh, that I picked up at the uh, Run for the Animal event. And uh, if you send me an email, I'll send you the, a PDF of all the information. Send me the information for the uh, newsletter, please. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I was going uh, to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rolf. All right, thank you. And with that, I think we're going to turn it to Tom. And okay. Let's have a great presentation. <laughs> well, uh, thank you all. It's uh, fun to be here. I think I talked with a couple of you, maybe during the fourth street, our fair. Um, but I did learn something about the group in the conversation. Um, I was a little surprised I, in a way, and maybe my, I misunderstood, but I asked the young man who I was talking with, uh, do a lot of people print? And he said, not really. And I was discouraged because for me, uh, you know, that's the final product. And uh, so I, I hope that what we say tonight will uh, encourage you if you're a little slow on printing to speed it up. Um, and since we were talking about bringing our four-legged friends, I just wanted, this is Sam, uh, this is uh, Happy, our dog, and I just thought I'd <laughs> make sure you have him join us here tonight. So uh, I don't know if they can see that. In, there. <laughs> in any case, um, so we're going to talk about values uh, in 
printing. And I have a feeling that some of you probably know as much or more than I do about this subject, looking around the room. I started many years ago, and uh, uh, some of you have too. I can just tell we all have that same color of hair. You know? yeah. um, in any case, Gail and I will go through some, some things this evening. And uh, I want to start out a little bit with a slide. Let's see if I learn how to do this little trick here. Yeah. This to me represents an incredible concept in art. If you look at it carefully, the Flammarion piece, as it's known, notice that the person inside is sticking his head outside his sphere of experience. In other words, he's going beyond the traditional going beyond uh, the experiences he's had in life. And I always like this idea because this poor fellow is going to see whole new worlds that he can't see as long as he's trapped inside. And so I use this in a lot of different presentations, not just photography, but in others as well, uh, because it challenges us, hopefully, to open our minds to thinking. Would you like us to turn the light off? No, I would not. Turn it off. Okay. I, 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 thank you. Um, now, one of the things that I use this slide for is to think about new ideas and be creative in ways that you do things. Now, there's a lot of traditional ideas that we'll talk about, but also we would like to have you think about new ways of doing things. Um, for instance, an example. This is Vanna, by the way, <laughs> for, for you old timers. All right. This I'll is Vanna. This is an example of solarization, which is a different way of making a print. Uh, are you all familiar with solarization, the process? Uh, some are, some aren't. And it's a trick in the darkroom. You actually have the original image there, uh, which I've printed straight. But in the darkroom, during the process of development, you flash your light just quickly. That little burst of light changes everything. It reverses it. And this is known as solarization. And you'll see this uh, occasionally in books and so on. I put something just in trying to do something. Oh, OK. That, that's not, but we don't want that on the screen yet. No, no, no. OK. I'm, I'm, I'm going to. Yeah, just, just a second. Okay, just a second. You're the boss. I, yes. I'm used to my machine. I'm not used to this one. That's all right. It's okay. Yes. And while he's doing this, uh, we can show you another example, uh, a little Flumerian idea, something going beyond the traditional solarization. And then we have here, uh, this is an example of uh, infrared work. Now, years ago, I did infrared in film, and that is awful because you're out in the desert trying to take a picture, and suddenly you have to throw the film into the ice chest to make sure that it doesn't heat up. Um, so, what we did a few years ago, and some of you, I'm sure, have tried this, we sent uh, one of our cameras and lenses to a company on the West Coast and have it recalibrated the sensor in it, uh, to be sensitive basically to uh, the uh, infrared spectrum. And so that makes that work easy, a lot easier than, I still have film in the refrigerator, infrared film, and it's probably already dead in the water uh, because it's been sitting there so long. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, another thing that we do, and this is something I would encourage you, as you think about your photography, um, Capture an emotion, tell a story with your image. And this image uh, is, for me, showing uh, a tremendous emotional response on the part of the subject. And by the way, this particular photograph was executed in Motel 6 in Bloomington, Indiana. <laughs> Quick story. Gail's house was burning down 
The model from Minneapolis was staying with her. Suddenly we had no place else to work. So I pull into the Motel 6 down there with all the gear and I go up and I say, I need a room for a week. And the person's looking at this young lady sitting in the, <laughs> in the car. And, uh, and I said, but nobody can go in the room because I had all the equipment in there. We're mm -hmm. gonna move things around. So anyway, but that was one of the pieces we did there. And for me, uh, that was a favorite of a number of people just because of the emotion that it, it, that it, it expressed. Um, so your, your photos oftentimes are going to be about stories, about emotions, about very special memories to you. And uh, I mean, there's photography, there's sports photography, there's news photography, so on. But in terms of what you people, I think, probably are doing for the most part, are not professional sports photographers and so on. So your work is something else. And so I would suggest to you to try to have your work tell a story in the process or express an emotion like we just saw. Um, you're all familiar with Garrison Keillor and how verbally he can tell a story and you almost get these ideas in your mind. Uh, and of course, uh, Mary Oliver, the famous poet, um, you also are familiar with Ansel Adams and some of his work, which we'll see shortly. And also, uh, one of the things we're going to cover today is values such as uh, specific values that you see when you look at a scene. And I would encourage you when you go out to take a picture, you know, it's very easy to hit about 35 quick shots. Please don't. <laughs> but we do. I mean, it's, it's seductive in you. But when you go out and you look at a scene, take a moment. What is it about that scene? Why am I stopping? And why am I looking at it? What's in that scene that seems to stick out above everything else in the scene? Think about those things. Because as you build your final decision to push the shutter, a number of factors are going to come to play here. The light, the intensity, the color, whatever it may be. Talk to the scene. Become one with that scene. Allow that scene to talk back to you. And find out what's in that scene that inspires you. Rather than just going out on a field trip, which we all do, and suddenly there's everybody lined up and they're all shooting the same scene. Um, which is fun. But on the other hand, it may mean something to you, but it doesn't mean to this person. And you have to decide how you can do that in the final print, how you convey that emotion at that time. In the final print, and you're gonna hear me say that a lot. You gotta print those. You have to, like it or not, you gotta print. Um, so we'll show you some examples um, of some of these things, but as we get to them, let me see if I can do this little magic thing sure. here. As we do them, we're gonna talk about the various components uh, in photography. And one of them, evaluating the scene. And by that, we're beyond now. We've decided you love the scene. <laughs> so now, how are we evaluating? We're evaluating it in part by the palette, but in our case, black and white. And we're evaluating it in terms of light intensity and uh, the different grades of light as you see it. Um, you're going to use the tools in your camera as you do this. For instance, most of you I'm sure now are all digital photographers. Um, your camera has a spot meter in it. And you wanna use that spot meter to help you understand the range of values in that image. Because we're not just talking about 18% gray. We're talking about specific values in the scene. What are the highs, what are the lows, how many steps between them? Because those are all things that whether you do it in the dark room like we do, or in the digital dark room like we do, you're going to make notes, at least hopefully in your mind, um, how many steps we had there and how you're gonna compress or expand that to bring out the things that are important in that image. 
And then, of course, the post-processing tools. In our case, it, the, the little thing didn't come. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Uh oh. Oh. Uh, Rolf. Yes, what up? I don't know. Maybe I didn't. <laughs> Maybe it's my fault. It's error in production. Maybe. All right. Yeah. So we'll see if we can get this one up. That's the important. Yeah. Let's go back and get yeah. There, go there. Nice. No, one more back. One more. Oh, that, you you got the, 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 the scene, right? Yeah. And then the next school in your camera. Uh -huh. The next one more. And that one's the perfect one. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, how are you doing it? What magic? Just, just, your finger's different than mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, you have a loose focus. Okay. Just make sure that the mouse somewhere in there and then click and that's what can take. Gotcha. Okay. Focus in there. All right. There we go. That's All right. that's, that's the want. next one we want, right? All right. There. All right. And this, this is just a little play on words. But, <laughs> you know, when I was talking about values and so on, of course, uh, the great God, Ansel Adams, came along. And he gave us uh, the zone system. And so this is just a little fun. Uh, by the way, that uh, we need to acknowledge this. Uh, probably it was copyrighted. So for all of you who are looking at this on Zoom, delete it right away. Uh, you might want to read it. It's kind of small. Oh, and God said, let there be light. And he divided the light into 10 zones, <laughs> just in case you didn't know that already. Okay, now, well, let's see what we're going to do here. All right, so we've got all the tools now. We went through them rather quickly here. Um, all right, this is the zone system. And probably a number of you aren't familiar with it if you're just coming into the world in the digital cameras. But you should be aware of it because this is gonna help you evaluate a scene and how to handle it later on in the digital dark room. And you'll see here, there are 10 zones and this is kind of the classic for us old black and white photographers. This is zone five, which is kind of the middle of the universe. <clears throat> and so you'll go through these and there's, you'll just kind of get a sense of your image with that idea in mind. Um, it's a, so bright, but you can still see some detail in it. Then we would say that's zone seven to eight, somewhere in there. And then where's the darkest, darkest place? And is there any information there? And if there is, we'll say that's zone three and a half to four. So you count spaces. How many units do you have in there? So that's doable in film. That's very doable. What happens if you have zone 10 and zone three? Film doesn't do that. Oh, yes, it does. If you know the dark room, you take that in the way you expose it and then develop it, you squash that into a usable six zone level. And you can do that in the dark room. Kodak doesn't tell you that. But you can actually take your film and expand it or contract it, either one. If you have too many zones or not enough zones. So and you can do this in the digital dark room easier, probably, than we can do in the dark room. All right, let's see here. Here's the examples of those. Sure. Are they on here? They are. Like the Okay, here's an example. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is applying the zone system to a particular scene. And if you'll see here, uh, this particular image is referring zone three is down in here. Just a little bit of information, perhaps. I I disagree a little bit, but anyway. And zone five right here, the gray card, and zone nine way up there is too bright. But you know this because you've taken your digital spot meter in your camera, and you can figure that out. Now you know how many zones you have. And then you can also, in your digital, uh, look at um, your histogram and find out where you are with everything. And you can shrink it or, you know, you guys know how to do all that. I can tell by looking. Okay. <laughs> cool. Anyway, that's one example of applying the zone system to a scene. So you're standing here and you're looking at that scene. Okay, what do I have here? Uh, all the zones. 
we see what they are. And we see that in this scene, there's more zones than we can achieve. So we learn the tricks of the digital dark room or the tricks of the wet dark room. And in the wet dark room, we can expand and contract that image just like you can with your digital camera. Um, then here's another example of the same idea. And here, so you're standing there and you look at this scene. Now this is what I mean, people, look at it. Obviously, things jump out at you and some things don't jump anywhere. But in looking at that scene, it's gonna help you to decide how you want to render it in your print. Uh, and you're gonna do that through using the tools that are in your Lightroom is what most people use, so. Thank you. <laughs> you you got your time coming, but yeah. Okay, and then we go um, using the spot meter and using the histogram. And you can use them both in your digital work. We use them only in the dark room, the spot meter. We have a different way of dealing with the histogram, which Gail's going to show you in a little while. Um, we've already talked about that. Just place, you know, how many. I think another one. Yeah. Uh, brightest areas. We've gone through that. Now, you've all seen this image Angel Adams out in Yosemite. And when you look at that image, you really think that's what he saw? You're dreaming. No, it did not look like that. What he did, though, he measured all the things he had to measure, like I just said. He understood, and this was, by the way, the wet dark room. He knew what he had to do. He did a couple of things. Are you familiar with fil filtration and black and white photography? Uh, Okay, so this side of the room wins and this side of the room wins. <laughs> um, Angela Adam looked at that scene and this is what he felt when he saw the grandeur of that. And he thought, okay, how can I convey that to you effectively? Here's what he did. He took his readings. He got stuff here and up there and up there. So he applied a 40, 29 red filter, simple little, and possibly tweaked a polarizer as well. And in that process, he changed everything because this is what he felt. Now, keep that in mind. Here's another one. You've all seen Moonrise over Hernandez. Mm -hmm. No, you haven't. <laughs> oh, no, you haven't. The Ansel Adams looks at that scene, and we've been there. We tried it. We couldn't. <laughs> anyway, um, Ansel Adams looks at that scene, but that's not the scene he looks at. That's the scene he felt. That's the emotion that hit him when he saw the scene. Are you ready? There's the scene. Mm -hmm. The bottom thing is there. That's what was, and look what he did, the same image, only he applied all this good stuff I'm telling you about. He looked at that scene, let it talk to him. He weighed all the factors involved, and then he went into his bag of tricks, part of which, by the way, is making notes. He'll write, I put this on zone three, I put this on zone. So when he puts it in the dark room, he can apply those same ideas to the wet print as he's working with. So anyway, that's the example of seeing something, but really re -re visualizing how it speaks to you. And it's a very simple process, but the point is you don't walk down the heat and keep hitting your button and hit two or three or four or images. You take a shot. I challenge you to take one picture of a scene, not 20, one. Stand back, look at it. What is it about that scene? 
what's sticking out to me? How can I achieve it in my digital darkroom? Because I'm gonna, I'm assuming you're not gonna do it otherwise. And then try to achieve it. And then go click and make notes. What was it? What did you see? How bright was it? How dark was it? And so on. Do I dare push this button again? Yeah. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, there you go. All right. Push it, keep pushing. Keep, keep pushing. Okay. Again. No, we're in. That's okay. Certain images are going to blow you away because the deep dark can't think, what can I do with it? And some images are going to blow you away because it's so bright. I can't deal with it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about several factors. One of them, we call it high key photography. And high key is an example of a particular image, which is very narrow in one spectrum. Can we, can we look at that for a minute? Yeah, Here, here's an example of a high key image. We're going to leave them as plastic too. But everything in here, is about zone six, seven, eight, somewhere in there, in terms of uh, using the zone system. And that's a high key image. There's not much in there. White. And let's uh, let's look at some of. Uh, I need to pass okay. just a little bit here. Okay. Let's see. Let's see what we got. Another factor, along with high key. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. And here, where we have a, a system which um, is dominated by dark. Well, it, I think what we're going to show you isn't quite that strong, but that, uh, yeah, that would be. <laughs> this scene is predominantly very narrow. We have a zone seven, eight. And we have a zone three, but not a whole lot of midtones in here. So this is a different kind of example. And you're going to shoot this in a very different way. If if you want it to look that dramatic, it didn't look like that. It did. Uh, I happened to be standing there and I saw that and I thought that would really be neat if it looks like this. <laughs> so that's what I did. And then so you have high key and so on. And then the full range of mid-tones is really important. And this is where this separates, I'm not gonna say, that, this separates the older men from the younger men, the older ladies from the younger ladies. Uh, in a picture like this, if you look at this, and Gail, you'll have to walk that around, I know, but they won't see that. Okay. When you look at this one, um, well, this went backwards or something. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I knew we should have brought our own computer. <laughs> what, 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 this, you're, you're too smart for me. I don't know how to run this one. <laughs> this particular image here is an example of a full range within the scene. Now, you have to look at it carefully. The rafters inside there you can still see because of the way we printed it. And the outside through the back view into the background blows out everything. But we were able to measure it all, determine what we had to do. This is a silver gel and print. What we had to do was to squeeze it to make it all come in and also to do a little dodging and burning, which you can do on your Thing. Let me have that just a second. You can't see it. I can still see it up here. And uh, this here we are in the midtones. Uh, back here, this is blown out in the original. But because the negative, we exposed the negative, overexposed it to get everything in, um, we were able then in the dark room to go ahead and bring that information out for the print. And you'd see it better if it wasn't in that stuff. Okay, now I'm going to take a daring leap here. What am I going to do now? We're going to get back on track. Are we? 
All right. This is some touch, finger touch thing. No, 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 no. Just use the auto keys. Yeah, there you go. Okay. okay. But we're way back. You hit, hit, hit this one here. Oh. You do it. I don't know how to do it. Hit the object. You want to go back or forward? Forward. Just keep hitting the button. Just keep hitting it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh, go back. There you go. There you go. All right. I'm on. You're on. Don't sit down. <laughs> I hope you, your finger will work better than mine. Yeah, maybe, probably not. Um, this is about the wet dark room, but I think so much of the computer digital processing, it's all the same stuff. It just looks different. And I am so happy I did a lot of dark room work so that I know what some of those buttons in the light room and some of this stuff, how it, yeah, we just think how it uh, works. So in the dark room, this is a wet dark room, you have paper that you purchased, of course, and there's a lot of varieties of paper, just like there is in the digital world. Lots of choices out there, color differences, surface differences, heavier weight. Well, the dark room had that issue also. So we had a thing called a step wedge that you actually, that's a negative and you put it in a larger, put your paper that you were going to use and take a picture of the step wedge. And what you're measuring is how many steps your paper is going to be able to manage. So here's our here's our dark room. What we did, it's the same picture that's up on the screen. Lots of images and each one starts with a very low contrast filter on and as each step goes you put a different filter in it's all about the contrast filters and the higher you go I want you to notice there's lots of black a couple of grays and the rest is white yeah, no, I don't know. Okay. Um, this is your low contrast, and you begin to see there's grays and that. So when you're working, you can do the same thing in the digital darkroom. When you slide that contrast filter up, you're adding a lot more dark to your picture, but you're also really pushing the whites whiter. Uh, so in all of these are all the steps. So when we look at a negative, for example, here's a negative, we look at it and decide, well, do we want it high contrast? Do we want a lot of black on that? Or do we want lots of grays or you know whatever your situation is. Actually this negative that you're looking at here is one of the challenging ones because once again if you look carefully we wanted to protect the information in the white area. It's still there. And that was it's there because the way we exposed it and then the way we developed the negative. And then it gets even harder when you get ready to make the print from this. Okay, I'm going to tell you my Flammarian moment, which was back in, I don't know, 2006 or seven or somewhere, maybe even before that. And I have a beech tree that is out my kitchen window, which faces west. So in the afternoon, the light is shining through that beech tree. Well, in the winter, the beech, lots of beech trees 
re the leaves remain on the trees. They turn out real brought nice tan and as the season of winter goes on they get thinner and thinner and thinner and I love that sunlight backlighting those leaves and so I decided how am I going to do that I'm going to take that picture but I don't want to have to look at the sun so I brought a leaf in put it on a light box so that it would be like the sun and as Tom said, when he saw the image, you got something there, Gail. You better go with that. So about probably 500 plant pictures later. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is one of my favorites. And what, what I do is my image of this is I'm showing you first a plant that is in black and white. That's a new look. I'm doing backlighting that really shows the veins. It shows the structure. And because it's this beautiful white in the background, you see a plant in a different way. And I, <clears throat> I have these up at our gallery many times and people will come in and I tell them that it's just it gets you to look at things that you normally would just large format about. camera, large format camera. Yeah, one one negative. But but Gail, how did you do that? How did you finally get to the print? Well, <laughs> oh, glad you asked. <laughs> that is a huge range. Thinking about our chart up here. But I wanted the foliage to be delicate. So we learned through Howard Bond. I hope you get to learn his name and maybe check out what he has done. He's retired now, but he was teaching the unsharp mask. And I know in Lightroom, mm -hmm. you go down and there's an unsharp mask. What that did is give you a lot more to do because you take your negative that you just saw in that one picture, you put that on the top of the enlarger, you put a piece of film down here, and you make what's called a positive. Then with pin registration and all this figuring, you sandwich those two together, and it does two things. It reduces the contrast range and it does a little bit of sharpening of the picture, even though it's called an unsharp mask. And so I was able to print to keep the white background white. I'm a real stickler on that. And suddenly things begin to look as I was hoping they would in my mind. So in fact, your your whole book are large format mask images, I believe. Right. And Gee, I brought a couple of books here tonight, so you can look later. But I, I want to add what she's not telling you is it takes at minimum two to three days to make one print book. But stuff has to dry, etc. Yeah. And um, and you have to calculate. She says you put it in the enlarging. There's a lot of calculation yeah. that goes on before you ever decide. So, you so, got these curves and so, so you've got a negative and a positive film exactly the same size and laid on top of each other. Right, and you you do uh, you have a tool that punches a hole in two holes in the side for the pin registration, mm -hmm. so that you can precisely put those two negatives together and. There you go. So I ended up, I ended up using like the highest couple of filters, and when it, everything should have been black, the white was white. And then the rest was at grays. I think the point here to achieve what Gail is doing, you can do it in the digital dark room, but you have to think that way. And then you can do it if that's what you want. If you want an image that looks like that. When you say filters, you're talking about polycontrast filters with polycontrast paper? 
Oh. Yeah, it's multicon. Yeah. Multi grade. Yeah, most paper now is multi Yeah. And they don't have a graded paper. Now, Howard Bond. Uh, yeah, let me jump in for just a second. Sure. We need to sing this guy to credit. Howard Bond spent time with Gulper, and he said, your, fil your filters are wrong. The filters you're referring to. They're not wrong. They just didn't do enough. In that set, you have a zero and a half and a one. Howard said, no, no, no. You've got about four steps between the zero and the one hand. And he created these new filters and they loved him. And he they rewrote the book on filtration because of his work. And this is a classic example of white on white. I dare you, I challenge you to do that. It's not easy. And he was a master at it. We have several of those others that exhibit the same thing. Go ahead, Pierre. Go ahead. Okay. So to find out where I am here. All right. So we do have more tools in your dark room for the post processing. And one of the things you need to do, especially if you're printing, is to calibrate your monitor um, and the screen on your computer. What does that mean? Well, you get a little tool and it adjusts your greens and blues and reds, right? You read your monitor. Yeah. We do have one, actually. We have the tool for good. good. Okay, um, good. Yeah. Around the club for people. And want. that's really important in printing because um, you want it, when you look at that monitor and you say print, you want your print to look like it did on it. You want to consider your room light as you view your monitor. You don't want to have red curtains or <laughs> blue curtains that are changing your light. What light do you use? What color? Um, we just use some LEDs right now and window. So you're not looking at white issue. Sorry. I think you want just okay, neutral. Right. Yeah, something neutral. You don't want to brighten it up and make it turn up. Yeah. You you've got tons of papers. I said that earlier. You gotta choose your paper. We chose our papers because we've been mounting our prints on a bright white mat board. Well, the yellow papers that a lot of those uh, digital papers are just don't look right because we use a window, window mount. So we leave a little bit of the mat board around the image and using the paper profiles that come with your papers if you're using something other than what your printer company is and this is an important one that we don't always consider you know are you going to be in kind of a dim light and but you've got all this bright stuff and it suddenly isn't going to look so bright you might want to consider where are you going to place that if it's in your house or if you somebody else is interested in that. Um, just thoughts, you know, things that don't, first of all, come to mind, I think, especially. <laughs> and it does take time to make a fine print, whether you're struggling with something at the computer or you're waiting for something to dry so that you can go to the next step. But prints are really nice, and I know you can have a ton of them, or you can have just a few, your decision on that. But we, I really like, kind of like reading a book, maybe I really like holding a book and, and reading the, the print. I'm old, I guess. So we studied a, a week with John Sexton several years ago, and he is one of, he and Howard Bond, I consider the masters in the dark room that I know. We watched him print Corn Lily, which he's printed a lot of times because he's got, he dodged and burned. But then he, I mean, he was all <laughs> over that print. 
but it's beautiful. You know, he again, he kind of saw what he wanted in that. And in the aspens at dusk, we saw him do bleaching, especially of the, the near trunks on the, the aspens. Now, those of you on the side of the room uh, probably aren't seeing zone 7.5, the real white in those aspen trees. And that's why I came back here. Okay. Looking straight on, you can see that. They're, they're, and he, he sits there by the hour. Yeah, and because he makes, he's an artist. He makes 100 prints of those, too, so he's really got <laughs> the technique down. But there were so many, I thought, I could, I, I'm doing a few and happy with that. So, any other additional prints? Yeah, you show? based on what you said. All right, ahead, yeah. here's our our final little thought to you. Yeah, Henry is the guy that helped us to learn how to see. Um, I'm going to throw up a couple of images here. This is a Howard Bond image, and this is an incredible image. We didn't talk much about midtones, but midtones <laughs> are critical in an image. You can you can control the blacks, you can control the whites. It's the midtones. If you look carefully at this, just notice the midtones in there. He has everything in there, but the midtones are still in the image. Here's another Howard, white on white, basically. Just incredible. Again, I would challenge you to, to match that. It's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll go around this way first, just for change of things. A lot of white. So, so when you talked about the Aspens and him working it bit by bit, I mean, does he put it? Is it an hour that he puts into each print? Or I mean, how, what kind of time do you make? A lot of time. Okay. His prints are very extensive. Okay. Uh, and again, he's an artist. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think one of the things that we learned from him, yeah. and, and you know, I forgot to say this, the most important <laughs> word <laughs> in photography, <laughs> the most important word in photography, patience. And the digital camera has ripped it right out of our hand. Mm -hmm. I do it. I sit there. Oh, yeah. Click, 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 click. Stop. Put a lock on that thing, you know. <laughs> and uh, patience is what John Sexton and Howard Bond had. This is another Howard Bond print. Talk about mid-tones and detail. We'll go through these fairly quickly for you. <laughs> There's Generous with this information. It's like a photo gravure thing. It's like a photo gravure thing. Yeah, printing, uh, printing plants could create these type of images. Yeah, books as a fabulous. Um, this image uh, is an example of contrast bright, real bright and real light or dark. And this one here, I was wanting to try. This is one of my images. I was trying to keep maintain detail in the white and the blueies, and yet still bring up the the dark half tones and darker images in them. Have yeah, I'm gonna say one or two more quickly. Another thing with patience is how to use light. Uh, 
you know, if you're doing any studio work at all, which is what we do in part, you want to use your light and, and you, you can look at it and you can see where things are going to fall. So that's another example of just a shape and a form in light. And another high contrast one in the studio, and this is all about design. Excuse me, can I jump in? Um, is it possible to get off the PowerPoint presentation uh, for the Zoom audience? That's all I'm seeing. I can't see any of these images. Can we get into the room, please? Yeah, hang on. I've been showing them to you. Nobody, <laughs> nobody said anything. Thank you. Anyway, this is another example of just a, a visual idea of seeing the, the triangles and the shapes and the, the way you use light. You see this? Yeah, you mean you want to show it? Okay, this clip. is the picture with. I I don't see it coming at me. Oh, I need to do this. Okay, this is the cover of Gail's book. Same process that she explained to you before. Here, I'll take that. You know. Okay. All right. You need to leave at eight. Is it? It's nine, actually. Oh, right. yeah. oh, okay. Okay. Well, we'll just keep talking. <laughs> and this is another Howard texture piece. Hey, Gail, you didn't show it. The cover photo. Which one? The cover photo. Cover. Take it over. Oh, right here in my hand. All right. Okay. Oops. Just go and have me go. Okay. This is the cover of my book in that unsharp mass process. <laughs> this way? Yeah. You also make it on that part that into the room. Oh. You know what it is? It's just flowers, but what it is. Do it. Do these dry out the same way? Because the, the leaf, what you said before, were like really thin. You have to have a really thin for the white to penetrate. Yes, I, and I find the spring, spring leaves, the fresh ones, are the most translucent. So that's what I, I look for. But I have some other things and they they don't have translucent <laughs> it's about the shape or the form you know as much as looking at a flower I did a lot of trees and flowers trees and I had a lot of people when I did a, a series of maple flowers and I said, oh, this is a sugar maple in flower. And a lot of people would say, hey, I've seen that. Look up. Yeah, you didn't have any of those. Yeah. They're in your, are they in your book? I, I, they might be, I don't know. Or you color people. You can have that one. This one, this is Happy Boy, uh, our rescue. <laughs> and the reason why I show this is because we've been mostly talking about black and white. And uh, I and I also printed this in black and white. But in this one, whoops, sorry. Hello. <laughs> Where are I'm you? Talking to it. Okay. Uh, there it is. That's Happy Boy. And notice the color. And for those of you in the room, that's what caught my eye was the color. The color of the dog color of the wood, color of the leaves, and how it all went together. And, and then that just caught me. And so I decided I would take a picture of it. And being black and white photographers, I had to take a black and white, make a black and white picture. But this is, this is what works in this case. So, you know, there's a place for color and there's a place for black and white. That's pretty much monochromatic anyway. That's yes, it is monochromatic. And that always catches anybody's eye. Yeah. Good point. Thank you for saying. I don't have the maple tree in the book because I've taken that later. But 
but I will tell you an interesting process. Here's the tulip. Um, my sister wanted some of my pictures. She liked them, but she said, oh, I'd like, I'd like it to be black. It would fit her thought better. So in Photoshop, I did invert. And it's hearing her and yeah, you're talking, talking to Karen talk, talk her. Hold that over okay. there. And, <laughs> and so I did invert and Photoshop. And this is not an example, but the background suddenly went black. And the plant just popped out of the page. And so she has three of my pictures on her wall that are in black. So again, you never know what idea might pop in your head, but they're pretty dramatic when we get the uh, reverse print. When Gail and I did this, we hers was wild harmonies and mine was sensual harmonies. And we did these together. They're both black and white, you notice, know black and white. And um, um, we had a wonderful time producing these books because them. the company, we went through all Abrams, everybody. And the company we finally chose won all the Bennies uh, that were out. That's a, you know, Bennies in the port of publishing. And so we went with them and they put us up for four days, fed us, let us approve every page. And it was an incredible experience. Um, a great learning. And in fact, there was a nice article in later magazine yeah, about that, yeah. about the books in that process. <laughs> but uh, yeah. it was interesting the difference. She uses the flower forms and I use the human form. And in the book, I use musical instruments. Like you see, I think on the cover, isn't there a musical instrument? Yes, yeah. yeah. And uh, so I'm using that form of the instrument with the form of the model to do that. And we did not bring these to sell. Not if you want one, <laughs> but we, we just wanted to show you how we went into the black and white and pretty much stayed there. The only time I, in my life, I spent most of my life in wildlife photography. So everything was colorful. And for you old timers, does anybody remember Kodachrome 10? Not Kodachrome 25 or no. Yeah, in the old days, Kodachrome 10. And then they got up to 25, and then eventually they squeezed it up to 50. But, and then the Ectochrome started getting better, it quit turning green with time and all that. And so that's where I did all my color work. And I still do today when I'm doing wildlife work. Uh, but for the most part, this is the kind of stuff we do. But the same information, patience, view the subject, know your equipment. It all works the same, no matter what your subject is. So if I can leave you with a couple of things tonight, because I have Toto over here, <laughs> Dorothy. <laughs> getting nervous. Patience. Don't be in a hurry. Let something talk to you. Take fewer pictures, but take better pictures. And watch the whites. There's nothing worse than muddy whites. So we we hit that a lot. But watch the whites. Anybody can print muddy stuff. But the ones you're going to look at, the ones that are going to stop you in your tracks in the gallery, are the ones where the whites get grabbed. And just make sure they're not blown out to detail. And so those, to me, those would be the important things. And uh, if you if you have any questions, ask her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, you you were talking about right, I think those uh, that your camera has a spot meter built in. I've got a pretty nice camera. I have no idea that it has a spot meter. I will, I will oh, yeah, that. Well, sure. Yeah. I, will yeah. it. I do now. I do use the histogram on it. Yeah, they, how do you go from histogram to your 10 zone system? It, is there is there a way to understand? Usually the, the curve is, you know, the bell-shaped curve if you want kind of a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and mid-tone could be middle. in the middle. Okay. Uh, but that's obvious. Is, is uh, one end, yes. zero and one end is 10, right. or the histogram is and, one. And if it looks like they're going off one end, 
your, your, your exposure was not correct. Okay, so I just look at both. And in your post processing, I know this is Lightroom, I don't use other uh, systems, but there's a clarity mm -hmm. slider, and that usually introduces mint tones mm -hmm. to your, if you just try it and you don't want to usually crunch it to the far side, but just a little bit will just give you some more detail in the, the movie tones. And like I said, on the contrast filter, it adds that black, but it also pumps up the white. So if you do that too much, it's just, yeah. Don't you, to your point, the histogram, the right side of that is your white, left side is black, right? Mm -hmm. Now, ideal, you will have information in, all, in the old zone. Mm -hmm. So you can see what that is. If it's one side dark, then it's too dark, one side light, so on. Or if you, that's what you want, right. you know, that real yeah, bright that's image. Look for. Just that's where you can, or if you want to have most of your histogram over here, but maybe you've got something bright, you know, to right. emphasize right. it. That I, mean, I guess it's just mentally mapping the histogram yeah. onto the tenzo system. And is right. it are and they evenly much, spaced across that? Or, yeah. 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 yeah, no, that's pretty much okay. you got. There was a question over here. Yeah, so maybe multiple questions. Um, the books, are those all from the large format film? Yeah. So Mine is. Yeah. You're, you're, minor, minor, medium format. Okay. Because in the studio, it just it worked. Now, when we work in the studio, digital is easy. Here, you want to see what we just did? Yeah. yeah. When I did this, we shoot two rolls of. of uh, 620, develop it, a week later meet with the model, you know, and now it's easy. So the digital world allows you to do things that we can't do in the film world. There's no question about it. We love them both. So I'm going to go to printing a book, right? So I'm guessing, you know, you did all your shots, then you, you know, marked it and on to your choice media, but that's not the same media that's in the book. What's that in translation? The the pile of pieces here. Right. These number of these were large format. Uh, most of them are large format. Just a couple of them are digital. But none of them are uh, 620 or 127. Or like, I guess what I'm trying to connect is, you know, your studio shoot those on film, but the book, I guess it's the concept of how do you get your film into okay. the book, right? So that's not, that's, right. when you enlarge it, you didn't do it on. What we did, here. What, what we did, we took all the images and we made them exactly the way we wanted them. We sent them off, they scanned them, uh, sent us images to review. And then when we say, that's good, they go back. When all was said and done, then we went there in person. And as we had a we had a team 24 hours a day, six people rotating to the 24 hour day, two of them at a time, working with this these big Heidelberg huge press. And uh, now I'm thinking. mine had an extra pantone added to it, but both of us. We learned this. We we varnished the images in the book. And you know why we did this? Have you ever had a book where you open it up? Sometimes half of the image is still over on this side. Mm -hmm. And that happens. You have stacked books up. So by varnishing the images, every time we they ran a, a set of our plates, they would run it again three times for me, twice for Gail. And the third run was the varnish thing. And that sealed everything <coughs> so nothing was gonna bleed away eventually. And these people knew what they were doing. But they, we had to come and inspect. Oh, yeah. They did several, they do a big page with maybe six Four. or eight pages on, a, on this big sheet, then it gets folded and cut. But they would 
All right, we just did this, come and inspect it. You had to approve, and you were watching the two guys, one at the end and one shoving the paper through this big 30 printer. yards that way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it come out, and we'd go, well, that looks pretty good. And the guy would say, no, 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 there's a spot there. And so they shove a whole bunch more paper in and come out with, Thing. So it was a very interesting And they allowed us, we looked at papers all over. They think carry stock. He said, no, this is what we want. So they ordered special paper uh, for the pieces that we did in the book. And they were a magnificent company. They're in Canada. And, and, I know a friend who used them. Yeah, and he he described the uh, process just as you did, very precise. Oh yeah, yeah. They want they bent over backwards to. They, they 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 were running about maybe ten presses at a time, but we had our team. <laughs> the worst part of the process. Oh, don't ever do this. The worst part of the process. Gail said we had to inspect every four hours, twenty four hours a day. We're sleeping. They they put us up. But we couldn't, be, we had to stay in the office on the floor and, okay, come in and now check on this one. You know? And it was, it was amazing because, oh, that looks, you know, you're looking at your, oh, wonderful. No, 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 we're going to do it again. And they would come back with a stack that high of these big sheets before they get the one that they liked. It's amazing. And so I said, well, what are you going to do with all those pictures? Because I didn't want them floating around the countryside. And they destroyed them. Mm -hmm. And then, after seven years, they destroy the plate itself. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So it's very ethical for the company. Any other questions? Anybody line up questions? So, sorry. What was the question? Well, I'm asking the moon line if you have any questions. Just a question when you finish, can you spread everything out yeah. so we can look? Well, we, I, but we're going to get kicked out of here. I think we don't want to. We got time. We still have time. We'll lay these out so you can kind of look at them. Okay. So you were there when the Heidelberg Press ran? Yes. How did that sound? <laughs> it wasn't bad, really. I mean, it was a huge room, so the sound was dispersed. I think it sounded wonderful. I mean, I, I used to work at R.R. Donnelly's. Yeah. Yeah. Big Heidelberg color presses. That's like incredible. Well, that, well, the, one of the neat things about this team, they were so precise. So they ran things through, and my stuff had this third layer of Pantone, Pantone because my musical instruments all had this warm wooden look to it. And so I wanted to bring that out in the images. We get there one night, and all you see is two legs out this side of the roller and two legs out this side. These things are big. And all you see is two, two people with their feet sticking out. What's happening? When they were running one of the Pantones, it splattered everything, and they had to go back and hand wipe every roller. So, I mean, they were... A rag, so you don't grab the rag and hold it. Yeah. You jog it as it puts them on just. I mean, these people were were spectacular. And like I said, we we looked at many, many companies and uh, they were the ones that we decided on. Not, not so that a couple of magazines had articles about our books and the work the company had done. Gail's got the cover of one of the magazines. Hi, Gail. Put a couple of these out. Okay, so if you want to look, here at things, no more questions, or you might get questions as you look. And you don't hurt our feelings if you need to go home. Hey, hey Don, you have your phone with you and you are connected, yes. right? Yes. So you may want to show the people yes. online. Walk, walk through and show my show, 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 show the picture with the with the phone so they can see it. Yeah. But that would be better way to show it. I, I, I don't know. Which pictures? And he is logged into Zoom with the phones. We can show the people. Oh, oh, I'll, I'll walk around. Okay.
Uh, Gail didn't mention that I heard a comment that our books are at the George Mason's house, and not just probably because we now there is a post test what are the two things that were so important besides printing good and good see we scored for this side of the room okay we redeemed ourselves what helps you be patient is a tripod <laughs> yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You yeah. never see those anymore with uh, the digital. Yeah. Oh, no. our yeah. club has every group there. There are tricons. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, my camera has eight stops. Vibration control. Oh yeah. So I I usually yeah. don't. Talk about black and white. Yes. That I can't think of the statement as photographer, the portrait photographer. Um, Gail has an original that he printed. Really? Gail. It's like who did Churchill and what's his face? Okay. Carsh. Yeah, Joseph Joseph Carsh. Carsh. She has a Carsh original, and it's as big as that screen wow. that he had printed. And well, I've it's seen this. I mean, maybe, someone. Maybe so uh, oh. Someone made a. Uh, a, a color version of it, and um, it, it's this whole character is lost. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, by the way, I should have mentioned to you, we have a show in our gallery, I think, uh, yeah. Toto, <laughs> Dorothy, yeah. Dorothy, yeah. Um, and it's an extraordinary show. If you get a chance, if you want to have a field trip on a Saturday, the 21st of October, and come up and see this exhibit, it is well worth it. It's uh, extraordinary work out in Palouse, in Washington. I've never seen anything quite like it. Is it on your website? I probably not. I don't know. We send out. We have a big mailing list. Um, but that might have. Uh, I, Dale might know. I don't think. Okay. There you go. This would be much better. Show the pictures. Oh. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna try to show the picture much better now. Yeah, I know. That's where my head is. I overthink it. You're gonna go through and do it also. Yeah, sure. I'm gonna see <laughs> this would be much better. Wow. Can you guys see this? Can you see this better, guys? And give yes or no from the audience. I guess yes, no, maybe. <laughs> I know what else can tell you. Can you see this one? I'm sorry. This was the challenge. I see it very clearly. There's a lot of texture to it. Get it, get a plus to see the texture. It's a close up. That's the cover of our book. Those are tulips. Those go white. Well, this is the white on white. Mr. Bond, I believe. Mr. White on white. Yeah, all the textures. Yeah, no, I know. That's right. I made some positive. 
Anyway, I looked up the whatever they take with that. Um, so, so I can check it out. Yeah. 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 I'm going to try to fix that to the other side. Okay. Yeah, I think you want to do it like you would Okay. Oh, I see. You want to. Yeah, you want to fit it to the. Yeah. So you're like putting in pens. Yeah. By the way, also in Louisville, you were talking about yeah. Louisville, their biennial is on right now. It's their biggest photo show of the year, and it runs through the month of October, I believe, September to October, and they have a nationally renowned keynote speaker. But all the galleries in Louisville will be featuring photography, and you can, you can uh, get in touch with uh, one of the board members of that group, okay. Paul Pelletti in Louisville, who has a magnificent gallery of his own. He owns many of the Karshas. Um, and uh, he can give you all the information if the club wants information about the uh, biennial, as it's known. It's very famous. There's probably 50 galleries showing outstanding photography all over. Thank you. It's, uh, it's on now, and I think it goes into... Pretty far into yeah. It's well worth a visit down there. Wow. You know, I don't print enough of my stuff, uh, so you can purge me now to go. Uh, well, you don't have to print a lot, just print well. <laughs> <laughs> because then you, you know, you, you don't feel like you're wasting your time. Usually, I like, yeah. Because, you know, things that are the capture or the negative. Yeah. score yeah. 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 even the music yeah. 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 